So I'm James Downer with the University of California Cooperative Extension in Ventura County. My colleague Tracy Takeuchi is at Cal Poly Pomona as a professor there of horticulture, and she'll be fielding the questions for me. Today is our second webinar in the series Grow Trees or How Trees Make a Better World. And uh, the theme is to grow trees, don't just plant them, although today's webinar is about planting. And I, I kind of wanted to let you know about this really cool thing. If you go to uh, morningagclips.com, there's a little newsletter I get every day. And I looked at it this morning. Uh, it's kind of like reading the news for me. Some people look at the New York Times. I look at morningagclips.com and I go, oh boy, morning ag clips. And today, what do you know? An Arbor Day article popped up that had my theme, don't just plant trees, grow trees. And the whole article was about uh, growing trees from another UC professor. I don't even know the person at Santa Cruz, but they basically had nailed the idea. And so this is not unique. Um, just planting trees, million tree planting campaigns and such uh, aren't necessarily gonna be the answer. We have to steward these trees through time. And so planting is just the first step. And that's the step we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk about how to get started correctly with our, our tree growing campaign by planting a tree correctly. So let's launch in. So we have a lot of things to cover today in the webinar, relatively um, few slides actually. I don't have a, a long talk, but we have a lot of things to talk about. And so you can see the list on the left are all the things that I'm gonna try and take care of. And um, hopefully after this webinar, you will be fully equipped with how to plant a tree and what the best way to do it is for the best outcome. So the first thing we have to do really before you plant your tree is select a good site. And this may seem, you know, like a simple ask, a simple thing, or you may be locked into a site. You don't have any choice. You know you want a tree and it has to go in this spot and that's your choice. So I understand we can be constricted that uh, a lot of times your choices are limited, but if you have room, you have to think about what the potential of the tree is. How large is it gonna get? What are its needs? It needs sunlight. It has to have sunlight. So you can't plant trees in dark places uh, or areas where they're not gonna thrive because they don't get the sunlight they need. So in this site, in this picture, this is in uh, lost in Nevada. Um, this tree has lots of room for sunlight, although the buildings may shade it significant parts of the day, but it doesn't have as much room perhaps underneath there. It's relatively constrained by the patio and uh, it, its root volume may be very limited. We don't know based on how this particular site was built. And so it may actually be struggling because it's constrained. So we have to have room above and we have to have room below. We have to have room for the tree to develop over time. And I think this is the hardest thing for everyone, including myself to, to realize is that this little thing we're putting in the ground today could potentially be very large 10 years from now. And seeing that, seeing that in advance is somewhat of a challenge. Well, once you have that tree and you're ready to get it in the ground, we have to go back again to a little bit about inspection we talked about last time. And that's particularly looking at the tree root system. Uh, and these images are from Dr. Linda Chalker Scott from Washington State University and from Fine Gardening Magazine. And it shows the process of evaluating trees for girdling roots. And here we see girdling roots uh, and this relatively small individual with large girdling roots. This can be dealt with by removing the soil 
and taking care of those roots with clippers and, and basically correcting the issues that might be there. The middle image has relatively few uh, problems, I would say, although all the soil's not off of them yet. Some people may be concerned that washing soil off the root ball is gonna harm their plant. And uh, most of the research done on this says no, we can bare root most things and plant them. And this is a, a really nice advantage because uh, it allows us to inspect the tree before it goes in the ground. And then we can use the native fill or the site soil to settle in or mud in, as some people say, around that root system. So it's contiguous with the, the entire site. And this gives trees a real advantage. We're not trying to get the tree roots from a, a organic root ball into a clay soil. And so um, bare rooting and root correction at the beginning of the process is very helpful. And I, I would suggest that if, if you're interested in, in knowing more about this, you look at Dr. Charker Scott's research and there's been a few others at Washington uh, State that have done some of this research. So another thing you might encounter in your journey of how to plant a tree are all the planting diagrams and details and specifications, particularly when you're involved in municipal plantings or in um, uh, community work or organizational work, you may end up with specifications and they may be dictated to you by another agency. And in a lot of cases, in fact, like most all the cases, they're usually wrong. And they're not what I would recommend, and they're not what uh, current research recommends. Most of these diagrams and specs are carried over from uh, years and years ago, and they just keep showing up. And they recommend odd stuff, like on the very left, recommending a synthetic mulch pad. I would never do that. Um, the synthetic mulches are are generally not good for trees, and uh, they restrict air movement. And how do you water through that, depending on what it is, of course. And then the idea that the planting hole needs to be wider than the root ball. This is one of the most common, I think, misnomers that we see uh, in everything from textbooks on arboriculture to planting specifications worldwide. And, you know, if the soil is not compacted and if the soil is um, normal soil that grows things well, there is no need to create a large planting pit wider than the root ball. You can just create the hole to fit the root ball and the, the hole should never be deeper than the root ball. So each of these specifications has uh, the bottom of the hole uh, undisturbed, which is what you want in your planting hole. You do not want to dig the root, the hole for your planting for your tree deeper than the root ball is. So we have to know how, how large that root ball is before you dig your hole. If you're gonna root wash, that's even a little bit more tricky because then your root ball is sort of flexible. You have to be very careful that you don't bury the tree too deeply. So uh, this planting detail on the right gives a lot of instructions and it, it has a lot of good things about it. It has the um, um, admonition of not adding any amendments, which we'll get to later in this webinar. Uh, it has the stakes well outside the root ball. It has a berm for water. Uh, it, it says to irrigate thoroughly after planting. So it's do, actually doing a pretty good job in suggesting how, how to plant a tree. Here's a cartoon I drew just to show several things that are right and wrong. And this was from a long time ago, actually, but it still holds. Uh, in this drawing on the far left, the tree is planted too deeply and there's native fill over the root ball. This is always bad because there's an interface between the root ball, which is usually organic, and the fill soil, which is finer textured. And when you go to irrigate this, the water will go right around the root ball and it will never get wet. And so trees in this planting way uh, often perish from lack of irrigation, particularly 
if the root ball was intact. Now, if this was root washed, it wouldn't be as bad, but when the root, root ball is intact organic material, the interface will prevent the root ball from getting <coughs> wet or properly irrigated and the tree could perish. <coughs> Excuse me. In this slide, there's too much mulch around the stem. The root ball is set a little bit above grade, which is good, but we don't want to pile mulch up or volcano mulch as this can sometimes predispose to canker diseases around the stem. <coughs> and in this uh, cartoon, there's too much amendment. And the amendment is at the bottom of the hole and the root ball has sunken down because the amendment breaks down. And this is why we don't put amendment in the bottom of the hole, one of the reasons. And in the final uh, cartoon, it shows the mulch not covering the stem, but around the area beyond the root ball. And the root ball is slightly above grade, which is what we want. And it's undisturbed and backfill all the way around. So this, this is the correct way to plant a young tree. And you'll notice that none of these trees have any stakes on them. And we'll cover staking extensively shortly. But if we can get away with not having stakes in a given planting situation, and the tree is capable of standing without them, that is preferable to, to uh, utilizing stakes. And of course, as I'll show you, leaving the nursery stake on the tree is uh, a top sin we should not be committing, but often it is committed. So I found this drawing from Hot and Tot's Book of Trees around uh, circa 1945. Uh, very upsetting because uh, it, it it has several problems. One is the stake is close to the tree. It shouldn't be. Um, the root system has kinks and girdles, which should have been corrected. And there's rocks in the bottom of the hole. We, we know now that putting rocks in the bottom of the hole does not impart drainage. And that should never be done. And uh, yet it still actually happens, people putting gravel in the bottom of the hole. And also it suggests amending the soil uh, from the backfill, which we don't, we don't recommend anymore. <clears throat> Another thing to be a little bit wary about is putting trees in turf grass. And depending on the part of the country you're in, uh, turf grass is more or less important in the landscape. In the West, we're getting away from turf grass much more. Uh, because of water conservation and other reasons, but turf grass is still an important landscape element here. So this is a case in point. Both these trees were planted uh, in 1993. They're the same age. The giant tree on the right was maintained without turf grass for many years. What you see here are kind of mowed weeds that just came up from the winter rain, but there was never turf grass on the big tree. And the little tree had always been maintained in turf, tall fescue, its entire life. And you can see the difference in the growth of the two trees. And this is something we know from other studies and research in general about trees and turf, that they're not a good interaction. And so I, I have a graduate student at Cal Poly Pomona who did his master's thesis research on this. And here's a couple of images from his slides, uh, a California or Brazilian pep, I'm sorry, Peruvian pepper growing in turf grass and one at the same time growing in uh, soil without turf grass. And so you can see how um, the, the tree growing in turf was held back severely, even though they got equivalent amounts of water and fertilizer. So another reason to keep trees turf free is that um, turf grass right up next to the tree invites you to use a string line trimmer or some other method to keep the turf mowed, including running the mower right up to the tree and injuring the tree. But the string line trimmers are very toxic, if you will, because they're constantly hitting the young trunk. And many young trees have a green cambium that uh, is fragile and it can be injured easily. And so we don't know from research what um, how much severity it takes to impact trees, 
but we have a lot of anecdotal evidence by just examining trees and landscapes and seeing them stunted growing in turf and the kinds of damage and girdling issues that we see with the string line trimmers. So um, injury due to mowing equipment and string line trimmers is harmful to trees. And so it's best if we can just separate the turf from the tree, even uh, if we're just separating it by a, a small donut of three feet or, or less is enough to prevent this injury and allow the tree to establish better. And so really it's a matter of what's best for the tree. Are we going to um, you know, put up with this kind of injury? And, and it's interesting, this weed whip guard didn't save it from a lot of injury. And eventually the turf was pulled back because probably someone saw it was being injured. Here, there's kind of a, a rubber synthetic mulch that this turf grass is encroaching over and it, it's not being maintained. And here is bare soil. Um, none of these is really ideal for the young tree. We would like to see a young tree mulched uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but certainly keeping it some kind of cleared zone away from the tree is gonna benefit it rather than having it overrun by other landscape materials or compacted by foot traffic or uh, any of those, a number of conditions that can hurt the young tree. So root barriers are another thing that were popular for many, many years and still we see them installed. Uh, and in this case, it's almost like the root barrier is an excuse for keeping that three foot donut away of turf away from the tree. And uh, one of the main problems with root barriers is they actually don't function. So here you can see a surface root that was cut because it, was, it had either breached the barrier or was gonna breach the barrier. Let me go back. And the roots will go over the top of them. They'll go underneath, they'll push on them until they break. And eventually what we end up with in almost all cases is excessive amounts of plastic in the landscape that contribute to landscape pollution. And that's something that we wanna try and keep to a minimum in, in cultivating sustainable green spaces in our communities. So root barriers almost always fail, or if they don't fail, they succeed in creating girdling roots on the tree, and then the tree itself can fail. And I've, I've actually seen trees, large trees, uh, Canary Island pine in this case, fail because the root barrier created an hourglass situation underground uh, in concert with girdling roots that led to, ultimately led to the tree's failure. So we, we don't recommend root barriers. Uh, what we do recommend is planting the tree in a place that's compatible and usually not in turf grass. So another thing we see a lot of in California, and I've seen it in other states too, are root watering and root aeration devices. And they have little or no value in landscapes. And the, the reason is because if you recall from webinar one, uh, we talked about root distribution and you can see in this image how these roots uh, like to be on the surface. And this is the normal predilection of tree root systems. They wanna be where there's oxygen. They do not wanna grow deeply and placing water under the root system is not gonna make the roots magically go down there and get that water. Uh, more likely they're just not gonna get watered and the tree will suffer and or die. So um, these kinds of systems where you put irrigation in them and the water goes down past the root ball are, are not good for trees. And they're especially uh, not good for establishing trees, particularly with large trees. And it turns out that when you buy a specimen tree, very often this is when these specifications start to suggest using these devices and it couldn't be anything worse to do. Um, large box trees or large ball and burlap or large transplanted trees, the root ball has to be irrigated from the surface down in order to capture all the roots and get them moist. 
irrigation devices such as these watering tubes put the water under the root ball. The only way that the root ball gets wet is if the whole soil profile becomes saturated and you would have to irrigate for a long time, particularly in sandy soils to make that happen. Um, another reason that these tubes have been used and you see them here on the right with the vents is that with the idea that this is gonna provide air to the root system. Well, uh, research that was done on this by Larry Costello suggested that oxygen does not diffuse much more than a few centimeters from these tubes. So given that they only are incorporated a little bit underneath the tree, they're not gonna do much. And so as an aeration device, they don't work. All the times I've seen these used in landscapes over the years, what happens is they get broken, they get damaged, they start to become landscape pollution. And once the root system has eaten them like this, you can't uninstall them. So you are stuck with this broken plastic stuff in your landscape for the life of that tree. Just don't put them in the ground. They're not necessary. They don't benefit trees and they shouldn't be used. Tracy, you have your hand up. I do. Um, did you speak to these being used as a method for measuring your irrigation efficiency? No, I did not. And um, I, I know various people have made that argument. And I, I guess I would say the, the number of that it's complicated first off. I mean, depending on what emitters are being used to apply the water will determine where the water is relative to the tube and it may not be consistent through a landscape. Sometimes they're used to check levels where water tables are high and whether or not that water needs to be pumped out. And, and so in some really high end kind of installations, um, they're like on a building where there's a, a vault and, and it's just a big container. You may want to know what the status of the water is down there. So there, there are those circumstances where that's been done, but I would say that they're limited. And, and the necessity of that for the general landscape is, is almost nil. So I don't buy it. I, I think that these are landscape trash and they shouldn't be used. Thank you. Good point and thank you for bringing it up. So here's another one. Should we amend our soil? And uh, the nursery industry, I think, upsells amendments and planting media and uh, planting, um, all kinds of planting stuff, fertilizer, various other products, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but generally, no, we do not amend the soil, even with peat moss. Uh, and so why don't we amend the soil? Well, we do have pretty good research on this that shows that it basically doesn't do anything. And, uh, you know, given the wide range of soil types that we have and the tons of different kinds of trees we might plant and the infinite amount of amending materials that are out there, especially when you talk, bring in compost, which is notoriously variable. Composts are, are probably all different from each other. So how can we then predict the outcome of an amendment for a tree? We can't really. And so you could make the argument then that, well, all those studies are flawed because they were just one soil type and one amendment type. And, and generally, that's a good point. However, the amount of time that, that that little oak tree there is gonna spend exploring its hole that is amended once it gets in that hole is so brief because yes, it, it, it will grow in that amended soil. It may even like it depending on what you amend with. But in a few months, the roots are gonna be in the native soil beyond that hole. And then the impact of that amendment is gonna be almost negligible. So that's in the best case scenario where the amendment is a good amendment 
and it's not going to harm the tree. It's not going to create an interface uh, in the planting hole because you didn't use too much, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But in the worst case, the amendment might be contain toxic levels of some salt, or it might contain pathogens, or it might contain weed seeds. Uh, it could contain all kinds of things that you don't intend. And so why add something to your soil that's going to limit the tree's ability to do well? You don't want to do that. So you might say, well, I have terrible soil. I guess if you look around and every tree in your vicinity grows terribly, then you should investigate that soil and find out why that is, and then take steps that are appropriate to that. And that's a bigger discussion than we can take today on planting trees in general. But if trees in your area grow and, and develop in pretty much a normal way, it's very unlikely that amending your soil is going to be necessary. So uh, over the years, Dr. Richard Harris, who was a UC Davis scientist, wrote the modern textbook on arboriculture, which had several editions and now is out of print. This was several years ago. He, he back in the 70s came out with recommendations not to amend soils. And so he was one of the first to kind of promulgate that idea that we don't need to put anything in the planting hole. And so the current recommendation that UC or University of California has is not to put any organic material in the planting hole. Use the native fill to backfill the tree. So what about staking? You got the, you planted the tree, you put the root ball at or above grade, you made the smallest hole that you needed to do that, um, and you've you've gone back and uh, the tree is too large to stand on its own. So what what should you do? Well, you might have to stake, and there are three kinds of staking you could do. There's protective staking, which are not shown here. Anchorage staking, not shown here, and supportive staking, which is shown here. And so some trees, because they don't have enough caliper or taper, which is the increase in stem thickness as you go down, they will not stand on their own. So this is a crepe myrtle, and it's a classic poster child of a tree that was grown in a nursery where it was rigidly staked, and it doesn't have enough uh, strengthen its trunk to hold itself up without staking. So the landscaper has wisely put in two stakes outside the root ball, loosely staked it so it can move. And in time, this tree will, because it's able to move, develop some caliper at the base and hold itself up. Now we also see two irrigation or, and or aeration tubes here, which as I've told you are completely unnecessary, but often used. So we would not recommend that. One of the things we do see is no temporary lateral branches on this tree, which is not a good thing. And, and the crepe myrtle really needs them. It needs temporary branches to build up the caliper in its stem so that it can be without stakes. And so this is kind of a bad thing. This tree doesn't have any temporary branches. Now this lophostomum, which is, uh, used to be called Tristania, does have temporary branches. But unfortunately, when they planted it, they left the nursery stake on it. And I would say this is one of the most common planting sins that we have today in America and the world is we, we get this tree and it's got this nice healthy stake on it. And it was like a 15 gallon tree or a 24 inch box. And we bought that stake and God damn it, we're gonna keep that thing. We're going to put it right in the ground with the tree and we're going to keep it company for at least the next five years. And this is the worst thing. In this, in this case, they're lucky they have the temporary laterals and they haven't cut them off, which is great. And they do have their two side stakes to loosely hold the tree in place. But the tree is still taped with the green nursery tie tape to its original stake, keeping it from moving. So this is a real oxymoron, yet we see this kind of planting in landscapes all the time, especially in California. So this, this is terrible. 
And a lot of times I, I get kind of my gorilla gardening hat on. And if I happen to have a pocket knife in my pocket, I will free this tree from the tape so it can move. I won't go so far as to take out the stake because oh, it's not my stake. But um, anyway, this, this is bad. In order for trees to develop caliper and not have to be staked, they have to be able to move. And that's why we do the two stake thing with the loose tie that allows the tree to blow around and move. And then the stem will develop an increase in, in stem diameter. And we call this taper. So as the tree goes from the top to the bottom, the stem gets wider. Both of these trees, you see no taper. And why is that? Because they were produced in nurseries where they had to stand upright and they were rigidly staked and they develop tall height very quickly when they don't have taper. And then the nursery can sell them to you as a large tree that won't stand up. So in order for us in the landscape to get them to stand on their own, we have to let them move. So we want the loose staking, but we have to get rid of the nursery stake. That is really critical. So we want to maintain the temporary lateral branches. It's going to shade the trunk, prevent sunburn. It's going to add taper faster. And it's going to help establish the tree quickly in the site. So this little oak tree in Ojai, California, is uh, the nursery stake has been removed. They have a little smattering of mulch, not enough, I might say. And they have the two lateral stakes. And in, in a short time, these can be removed. So the goal of staking is just to get the tree established. Once it's established and it can stand on its own and it's protected enough, then you can remove them and the tree can further develop. So here's a shot of Cal Poly's uh, National Collegiate Landscape Competition team. They've just installed or are still installing their demonstration landscape. This was in uh, Utah a few years back. And you see an example of anchorage staking. And uh, this usually isn't done for a 15 gallon tree, but it's uh, part of that competition. So that's the way they do it. But this is usually anchorage staking is done on larger box trees where we have uh, guy ropes or strings or wires anchored to the ground. And this will keep the tree from blowing out of the ground. Uh, alternatively, it also allows the stem to still move, which is good. And it will develop the taper and then the anchors can be taken off. Now, protective staking is an entirely different thing. The protective staking doesn't contact the tree. So the tree has no attachment to the stakes. This is in Kiev, Ukraine, and the street tree is uh, more than anything being protected from cars, which are allowed to drive up on the sidewalk. Uh, but also from other insults. So uh, protective staking may take the form of bollards or, or the very stiff uh, stakes that are temporarily placed around the tree to keep it from becoming injured. Because one of the most common reason why trees don't perform in landscapes or survive is they get damaged. It's just hard living in a city where people tug on the trees or they run into them or uh, damage, vandalize them or damage them in other ways. And uh, so some staking is required just to keep the trees from being damaged. Now, most staking materials are made of wood because wood is least likely to harm a tree. Um, T-bars are probably not a good idea. And also all stakes should be removed as soon as they're no longer needed. This tree didn't need stakes like three years before I took this picture. And so this is again, another uh, example of staking material that should have been taken out of the landscape. I don't know how many of you have tried to take T-bars out of the ground. Uh, uh, having a rural property, I do a lot of that. The best way to do it is to get a tractor and attach a chain and lift it up with the hydraulics. I don't know how you're gonna do that in a landscape. The, the next best way is to get water and, and mud them up and just wiggle them for a long time till you can finally pull them out of the ground, but it's horrible. You don't wanna use this kind of equipment. 
and you don't want to leave it in the ground for long. Another problem in staking, and again, this is the nursery stake that was left on the tree, is that depending on how it's attached, it can girdle the tree. And so we see this in all kinds of ways with wire, string, even the green tape can girdle the tree. And so trees need to be staked loosely, not tightly. So the order of go is no stake or a loosely staked tree or a tightly staked tree. And really the tightly staked trees are only done in nurseries because that stake will then be attached to a wire that uh, can keep the tree from blowing down in a wind event. Always remove the stake as soon as you can. Stake removal prevents girdling and the formation of reaction wood that will harm uh, the vascular tissue. So what we see this bulge here is reaction wood. The other problem with staking is that the shaded side of the tree the cambium reacts to the shade and it tends to grow cells on that side of the tree that are longer than the cells that are not staked. Then when you take the stake off, the tree will always bend away from the stake. And so the tree will not stand upright because part of the, the stem was shaded. So the proper development of trunk taper and uh, the ability to stand on its own will never be achieved when the stake is very close to the main stem. So we want to not do that. And then this kind of uh, close staking uh, partially up the stem can also lead to breakage of the tree where the tree just snaps off above the stake in a wind or something of that nature. So keep the stakes away from the tree. Um, try to stake as loosely as you can and get rid of the staking equipment as soon as you can. Another example, uh, a tree that's clearly not in need of staking, but is still very well staked. Uh, these poles are uh, rigidly attached and there's no need for them to be there. Ultimately, these kinds of things result in injury to the tree either by girdling or by uh, abrasion of the main stem. So we don't want to have that. We want to get rid of them. What about mulch? Well, one of the final things we would do after we get our stakes set and the tree is loose and can move around uh, is to apply a, a soil covering to prevent water from evaporating so the tree can be watered but not dry out. And so the best possible mulch, yes, we want to use mulch, is fresh tree trimming chips like you see here in my hands uh, with fresh wood and leaves. And we want to put a thick layer down around, but not necessarily contacting the stem. Uh, we don't want to mulch with cement as was done here along uh, Interstate 5 in Castaic, uh, where the cement goes right up to the main stem. This is a kind of mulch, but it's not a good kind of mulch because how in the world is that tree going to get any irrigation? It, it has no source of water now. And compounding that is the fact that it's a sycamore, which is a riparian tree that likes to grow in stream beds. So this is really a bad thing. And then um, boulder mulch or rock mulch, these, these are legitimate mulches. They can be used. They can be used around ponds. I don't care for them. Uh, it, it's difficult to remove the rock to see what's going on with the root system every time you want to look at it. Uh, but rock mulches have been used successfully in arid climates and in China all over the world. So it's just a little bit different. One of the things that rock mulches will not do for you is stimulate the soil food web as the wood chip mulches will. And they will not necessarily um, provide nutrients to the tree. So you, you don't get those advantages that you get with an organic mulch. Uh, one of the positives about rock mulch is you apply that one time and you're done. Uh, it's not going to break down in your lifetime and it's not going to blow away. So there's some advantages. <clears throat> um, some people have asked, well, how much do we apply? 
And so here we see just a very small ring around this queen palm. And yet that's enough to keep the lawnmower away from it, to keep the weed whip away from it. And also palm trees have their roots very close to the stem so that mulch might actually be functioning, adding nutrients. Uh, mulches will reduce weeds, they will reduce evaporation. And in the newly planted tree, mulches are helpful because uh, you don't want that, that root ball to dry out. You, and if you've planted it a little bit high out of the ground, as I suggested, it's going to be exposed. And so a covering is going to keep it from getting desiccated. Now, um, Dick Harris, again, Richard, Dr. Richard Harris from UC Davis, showed many years ago last century that um, a three foot ring around a tree will benefit it. And other researchers have showed this, that keeping the turf three feet away from a tree will help it to establish. Ideally, the mulch zone should match the litter fall zone. And that's often not possible in many landscapes, which is bad for trees. But if we're looking at this from the tree's point of view, a tree would like to be able to drop its leaves or needles and debris under the canopy. So the mulched zone ideally would be as large as the canopy becomes. And, and that again, is not always sustainable, but it's what the tree would prefer. So what about biostimulants, activators, mycorrhizae, vitamins, wetting agents, um, biostimulants, all these sort of things? They're often recommended for newly planted trees, but there's very little research-based evidence to suggest they do anything for them. So because I have product names and, and um, manufacturers showing on the slide, I'm not gonna say bad things about these products. I'm only gonna say that there's very little research to suggest that they benefit newly planted trees. So do you need to use them? No, you do not need to use them. What about irrigation? Well, irrigation is absolute, absolutely essential. And I think the thing to remember is that we're taking a tree that was used to being either in the ground if it was bald and burlapped or was transplanted from a different place or was in a container in a nursery. It was growing in a certain set of circumstances and it's used to being irrigated, especially if it was from a nursery frequently or regularly. And you're gonna, depending on how it was moved, you're gonna re, be root washing, you're gonna be cutting roots off that are defective you're gonna be reducing the size of the root system. That root system has to be kept moist to regenerate in the new site. And it has to be treated as if it is still in the nursery in many ways. So we need perhaps a temporary berm of soil around the tree to keep the water from flowing away. We have to apply water directly to the root ball. And this can't be emphasized enough. You can't just have your sprinkler system sprinkling the lawn that also squirts over by the tree and expect that to be adequate to, to irrigate the tree. It's not adequate. So we need to actually soak the root ball. And this needs to be done frequently and consistently after it is planted, no matter what time of the year. So sometimes trees are planted in Eastern states in the fall and they drop their leaves, they immediately go dormant and they sit there all winter. And then in the spring, the snow melts and the soil's moist and they grow into it and things happen. And that, that's, that's one circumstance and irrigation might be different in that circumstance. But in the Western United States, no matter when you plant that tree, all year it can be dry or droughty and you can't necessarily rely on weather to irrigate your tree. So if you're in one of these places and, and irrigation doesn't fall from the sky on a regular basis, you better be irrigating specifically that tree's root ball because it will rapidly dry out in your new site and the tree will die from drought. One of the most common reasons for trees to fail to establish is that they don't get irrigated um, either immediately or consistently after planting. 
So irrigation is critical. What about root barriers? I said a little bit earlier, I'll say a little bit more. They are no longer used by most commercial and municipal arborists. They restrict root volume. And why would you want to do that if you want your tree to become successful and healthy? Uh, they slow the growth. And curiously, they don't really redirect roots. You, you would think, oh, they're going to force the roots down. Well, roots don't want to grow down because there's no oxygen down low. So it, typically, roots will grow around the barrier, come back up to the soil surface, and continue exploring where they can grow well. Uh, and finally, they can make a hazardous tree. So by putting a circular barrier around a tree, you're going to have a very high chance that you'll create a girdling root and that that root will limit the tree's growth and the stem will not grow uh, enough to support the weight of the tree and it can break, which as I told you earlier, I have actually seen. Very often roots escape their root barriers or they break down over time, the plastics break down and the roots get out. And so what the end result of all this is, is either a failed tree or increased landscape trash. And so we don't want that. So root barriers are not an excuse to have, uh, you know, turf grass close to your tree. They almost always fail in time and they create more landscape pollution. So finally, um, just to summarize our points today, uh, keep your planting simple, correct the root issues of your planting stock or don't select a tree that has root issues, preferably. Uh, Keep the planting hole simple, only large enough to accommodate the root ball. If compaction is an issue in your site, then you need, really need to deal with that on a site level basis and uncompact the soil in ways that go beyond just planting a simple tree or take other ac actions uh, to remediate the compaction. Uh, do not dig a hole deeper than the root system or wider than the root system unnecessarily. Again, if, if you have a compacted site, well, that might be a reason for digging a wider hole. Uh, but if you don't, then you don't need to do that. Keep the temporary lateral branches. Um, do not use amendments in the planting hole. Keep the staking loose and always remove the nursery stake. Irrigate immediately to settle the soil in and monitor the irrigation for several weeks. Uh, yarn bombing, while not toxic to trees and may actually be helpful because it reduces sunburn, is not an essential component of planting your tree, but it does look pretty. So next week, we're going to talk about pruning. And I didn't talk about pruning the young tree uh, with the planting lecture because I'm going to cover it next week. And uh, we'll talk about all things pruning, including the science and the physiology of pruning, the pruning needs of trees at various ages, and uh, perhaps one of the most important things for some people, how to find a good tree trimmer. So that will all be next week. And uh, we look forward to your coming and hearing that lecture. And so with that, I'm going to stop my share. And... Um, I'm going to invite my colleague Tracy to bring up the interesting questions that you've you've accumulated that we've I was accumulated. Absolutely unable to answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I well, I believe you could I answer to, them all. I have to tell you, I've been on the computer so much. I'm sorry, I'll have to get quite close to the screen to read some of these. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this person, uh, Janet Beer, asked a very interesting question: If trees are um, not preferred to be growing in turf and established better without turf, why do you see a bunch of large trees that have grown in turf? Explain that. Well, that's a good question. Um, I guess there's a lot of different answers. And one of the things is that the turf may not have been there when the trees were young. And so the turf was added later after the trees were established. Another reason is that some trees, riparian trees, like sycamores and alders and a few others, actually do pretty well in turf. 
that there doesn't seem to be any inhibition uh, with the tree and the turf. Other species are more sensitive to this, maples and Peruvian peppers and conifers particularly just don't establish as well in turf. So, you know, get, getting, getting to that place where you want to be with your landscape is gonna take longer if you have turf around your trees. So we know that from a research perspective and we know that uh, trees tend to form fewer roots in turf grass. And so um, while trees can get large in turf, turf grass areas over time, it, it doesn't still mean that that was the most optimal situation for their growth. The other thing is that turf and trees are basically incompatible. Turf has evolved to produce allelo chemicals that inhibit the growth of things that are gonna shade them. So turf wants to be in full sun to be the highest quality. Trees of course have evolved to shade out stuff underneath them so they don't use their water and nutrients. And so trees are gonna try and provide the most shade they can to keep the turf from growing. So you have a basic incompatibility there. Turf wants full sun, trees want full shade on the ground. And so, you know, it's not a good combination. The, I guess we could harken back to Kuchenhoff's slide from last week. Um, what do you have when you take away the trees? Well, you have turf and tulips. And they've been able to do that because they very artfully allow enough sun to fall on the tree, on the turf, and they, the trees have enough room and wide swaths of mulch, which maybe you don't see unless you go to Kuchenhoff. But, um, it's a balancing act. So can we have trees and turf? Yes, we can. Uh, is it best to keep the trees out of the turf? Yes, it is. Uh, can we have turf adjacent to trees and have the turf look good and the trees look good? Yes, we can. So we can do all those things. It's just a, an artful thing. Especially if you're growing Earhart veltgrass, it tends uh, to grow wherever you have soil. All right, so um, this question was an interesting question and it came in from a, a couple of different people in a couple of different ways. So I wanted you to address this. Um, the first question I answered live was about irrigating trees on a slope in clay soils. And we discussed irrigating slowly, infiltration of the soil water from above the tree, allowing it to percolate down slope towards the root ball of the tree to be more efficient. This person is asking also, in conjunction with that, um, tr are there trees that will do well on steep hills or grades where the soil is thinner? Um, this person lives in a canyon with steep um, walls, shallow soil, decomposing bedrock, looking for trees to help retain soil in place and are low maintenance drought tolerant. So, you know, basically wants to win the lottery. <laughs> Well, roots are negatively geotropic. And that, that means that they, they want to grow down. So I imagine trees on a slope are going to send their roots down slope, maybe not so much upslope. And uh, you remember from the first webinar, root systems are not necessarily circular or even. So roots are going to grow in the cracks. They're going to, and they actually grow well on slopes. And I, I would suggest for the person that has the canyon environment to look around the canyon and see what's doing good in that canyon and try that. Uh, but canyon soils, steep soils, gravelly, rocky, poor soils, none of those are bad for trees. In fact, that's where trees grow really well. And out here in Arizona, all the trees are in the canyons. They're not on the ridge line so much and the trees that are on the ridge line grow smaller and less than the ones down on the canyon wall where there's a steep uh, rocky soil. If there's cracks and places in the canyon wall where the roots can get in those cracks, trees are gonna grow really well in that. And the soils don't have to be well-developed. Now, that the caveat there is that in those circumstances, the trees are allowed to drop their leaf litter everywhere they can. And that's part of that system that that's trees rely on all their leaves falling on the ground, mulching the soil, providing that soil coverage, even in those poorly developed soils. And we're gonna talk more about mulches in the fourth webinar, I think. But um, 
I don't see that as a limit to growing trees. Maybe placement and initial establishment is difficult. Uh, providing that water initially, I like the idea of putting it upslope because water is also uh, negatively geotropic. It's going to go downhill. So yeah, you don't want to place the water below the tree on the slope or the tree will never get, the newly planted tree will never get enough water. So uh, the, <clears throat> the rules still apply. Whether the tree is in a canyon or on next to a lawn or on a flat place, you have to water the root ball. So however you do that. Yes, so next question, my goodness. Um, can you re can you speak to removing the temporary laterals one more time? Uh, this person also sure. is asking, um, when do you think it's appropriate? And is there a, an appropriate size that you're looking for? That's, those are, that's really good set of questions and I didn't cover it. Uh, and partly I think, cause I'm deferring some of this to the pruning lecture, but uh, nonetheless, <clears throat> the temporary lateral, lateral branches form are, are left on to help the caliper of the tree get larger, but also to shade the stem. And particularly in exposed locations where sun is beating right on the southern exposure or the south or, south or west exposure of the tree, sunburn can be a real issue on nursery trees. Because think about it. They come from the nursery where they're all stacked up right next to each other in rows. And basically, they're all shading themselves in that environment. And we randomly pull one out of there and go stick it in a full sun location. And the, the main stem, if it has no temporary branches, is going to burn. Now, if the branches are there, the stem is protected, and it's all great. Uh, and you go, well, how long do we leave those things there? Well, what I generally do is I make sure that I prune them a little bit so that they never get that really big. They sh they're big enough to shade the trunk, but they aren't left to grow big like a permanent branch. And you know, in urban circumstances, the first permanent branch might be 13 feet going out over the street uh, or eight or 10 feet going out over the sidewalk. So everything is temporary up to those branches. And so they, they may actually get to be an inch or two inches in size before they're removed. But I, I think it's ideal if we can get those pruned off by the time the tree is shading its own trunk. So if you think about that, if, if the tree is able to take care of itself in terms of protecting its trunk with the branches that are higher up, then yeah, go ahead and remove the temporary laterals or keep pruning them back until they're insignificant. So next time when we do talk about pruning, we'll talk about how pruning is a growth retarding process, that it slows the growth of whatever you prune. So temporary laterals don't need to be unpruned. They can be pruned. It's just they, at, you know, they're left on the tree for a time until they're no longer needed, then they're taken off. I hope that answers the question. I think so. OK. Um, can you speak to gopher cages being used to protect tree roots? Yeah, I hate that. But then I hate gophers, too. Me too. Gophers are horrible. And so um, generally, chicken wire will break down probably before it girdles. But then again, I've seen some pretty bad chicken wire girdles. So um, what? A, you know, if you use anything bigger than a chicken wire cage, the gophers are going to get in there anyway. So I guess my answer to that is I don't like that stuff. Um, I would prefer to see you control the gophers in some way, whatever that is, trapping, uh, poison, however, you know, whatever your ethic is for that. Uh, but deal with the gophers and um, don't shelter. cage the root system. Hmm. Right. Don't cage. Let it be free. Cage free oh, trees. So um, in a, in a free uh, range California trees. Pest Control Advisors webinar I was on a few days ago, our advisor and informed us that Wilco, the producer of the gopher getter strychnine based gopher bait, is no longer importing strychnine into the United States and that product is likely to become unavailable. So if you utilize 
pesticides, be aware if you are trying to control gophers, that material may not be available for much longer in the United States. Um, anyway, moving on, we have any thoughts on commercial tubes for young trees? One person has posted the Tubex tree shelters. Um, we use tree oh. shelters, I believe, at Catalina, and one of my trees is still alive, yay. Um, for a short amount of time, can you speak to that? Well, Just unlike some of the other tree devices, tree shelters were actually well-researched and uh, some benefits were attributed to them. And particularly, you know, herbivory, you know, keeping things from eating the tree. So in wildlands and less maintained places, I think tree tubes are probably a good idea. Uh, the temporary branches just grow like crazy inside those things and they bunch up and they can be dealt with later after the tube is taken off. But if, if they, allow you to get the tree established in your sort of minimal input landscape, whatever that is, or a revegetation project. Sure, I have no, no uh, objection to that. And they are used a lot. I guess the one thing that I would say is they don't, tree tubes don't allow you to walk away from the planted tree. You know, they're not gonna magically irrigate your tree and they're not gonna magically, um, prune or maintain or otherwise do the horticulture for you and if anything they're gonna cause some pretty bunchy branches inside the tube so you still have to come back and do all that stuff so they don't abdicate your horticultural practice some people have said that they increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the tube and accelerate the growth and there's been a little bit of findings on that that suggests that's the case so um, I'm not negative on them. I'm, I'm not negative on them like um, irrigation and aeration tubes. Those shouldn't be used at all. Um, how long does the tube stay on? Depends on the tree. I mean, if it's a fast growing tree, maybe six months. If it's a slow growing oak tree, maybe two years. Um, th that really is dependent on the species you're growing. So one person, Maxwell Norton, is asking your favorite method for reducing damage from deer. I say, you know, my freezer, but that's I, just me. I, I say a 30-06. Yeah. Bam Bambi. Difficult. Well, deer, deer are a real issue. Um, yeah. We have a lot of deer here in the Chiricahuas, and we have to fence things we don't want them to eat in the Midwest and in Eastern United States deer populations are absolutely out of control in some places. So um, hunting, hunting is a good idea for deer. Uh, in terms of keeping them away from your trees, I cage trees up to six or eight feet. And the young trees that we plant out here, that's what I have to do, I have to cage them. And then after a couple of years, those cages come off. And that's been very successful for me. And by the way, Maxwell, how's retirement? <laughs> Maxwell is my colleague. Um, so somebody, I answered a little cavalierly, but you might want to address this for the general population. Someone asked about planting flowers underneath a tree, first a newly installed and B, a mature established. Um, I, I'm less worried about it for a newly installed because if you're watering your flowers, you're probably watering your tree, which is a good thing. Um, ultimately, it's not a good interaction. What, what should go around your tree is mulch. Uh, and in terms of planting around a mature tree, I did that when I was in college, when we were renting a place, I was doing the gardening and I, I mounded up some soil to make the landscape look more interesting. And it was against a silver maple. And I planted bromeliads all around and it's all tropical and we watered the crap out of it. And wouldn't you know it, that tree got a big canker on it right where that was done. So, you know, you create the conditions for disease by overwatering temporary plantings around a large tree and it's not good. Some trees will tolerate that more than others and uh, some trees are intolerant of that. So to a degree, it depends on which tree we're talking about and landscape conditions, soil types and all that. But generally not a good idea. The best thing to plant around your tree is fresh wood chips. 
fresh wood chips. Yay. Um, can you speak to tree roots that surface um, in a lawn or other situation? And should those tree roots be covered with soil or anything? Well, yes. Um, again, in general, trees want their roots on the surface. Some trees like liquid ambar and others will run roots right over the surface on in plain view. And covering them with soil is fine or covering them with wood chips is fine. Uh, covering them with a lawnmower is not fine, although that's done a lot. Uh, generally, trees have the proclivity of having their roots in the top six inches of soil. That's where they want them. That is not something that is caused by your irrigating practices or your fertilizing or lack thereof or your presence or absence of turf. It's the genetics of the tree that wants the roots there. So this is why having a mulched area near the tree and just letting the roots proliferate where they are going to grow is a good idea. It's, it's best for the tree. So in Virginia, a good natural landscape with heavy clay and lots and lots of rain, 30 yeah. years established, um, has ground covers under oak, willow oak, um, ornamental cherry, cedars, etc., that are including uh, periwinkle and some other things. Should she leave them alone, remove the ground cover, and change to mulch? What's the best way to extend the life of trees? Not sure I can answer that for a Virginia resident. So you, you know. Yeah, just... well, I'm not sure I can either, Tracy. I think, you know, that kind of question begs us to see the landscape. Like if we, could just, if we could just see a picture, you know, we could advise <laughs> you better. But, but generally keeping, keeping the plantings away from the main trunks is a good idea. Uh, clays are not bad soils. They're very nutritive. They're very sustaining. They drain differently and they may not take water in as efficiently, but they're not bad soils. And they're actually very, very helped by mulching. So mulching with fresh wood chips is going to uh, tend to open up or decompact clay soils over years of time. This isn't an instant you know, glorification thing. You can't, okay, I mulched, what's wrong with my soil now? You know, that's not the way it works. It takes a lot of breakdown and microbial activity and incorporation. And in time, those soils improve greatly. Can you still have plants next to your trees? Sure. Um, it's, it's a matter of balance and understanding the needs of the tree and the needs of whatever other plants you're growing. So uh, it's hard to answer that question specifically, but um, I think always keeping plants away from the stem or the root flare or the crown of the tree where the roots and the main stem come together, you don't really wanna have other plantings right there. It's better just to have that area bare or, or mulched with fresh wood chips. What about trunk painting? Oh boy, we see that in Europe so much. Latex and paint? Latex paint, white latex paint. And um, I've tried to understand why they do that and I, I've been told lots of different things from frost crack prevention to all kinds of stuff. Uh, mo mostly has to do with freeze injury, why they use the white latex paint. But um, for us here, I guess it depends on your tree's own situation or your yard. If, if, if something has happened, like another tree fell, and now the tree that is left is getting full sun where it never did before. There's some advantage maybe to painting that trunk for a while till the vegetation grows in or the, the tree's bark acclimates to that high light intensity. Uh, but just to paint a trunk for the sake of painting, it's a little bit silly. I mean, who was painting the trunks before people came along? I mean, really, come on. Have a purpose, right? Yeah. Um, so this person has a tree that is growing on, a, on its side, blue spruce, leaning on its side. Would you recommend staking it to make it straight? No. This depends on how old it is. <laughs> well, it's not going to make it straight. No. So the cells in the tree are already altered if it's curving as it grows. 
right? The shaded growth of that tree. So that is not going to correct. No, I, I don't know. Again, I guess seeing a picture would really help orient that question. But yeah. um, if it's if it's curving because it's shaded and it's growing toward the light, um, the tree was probably planted in the wrong place or something has redirected it may have its lodged. growth. It may have root plate lodged. Or that, yeah. Yeah, lots of things. Um, so we've so, already kind of talked about root barriers. I'm going to move on because I think we kind of talked about that unless you want to speak more to that issue. Well, is there a question that's controversial or? Um, or... We've already talked about root barriers and including along sidewalks, they just don't work. Yeah. It's the, oh. the nature of the root barrier and the tree. So um, I think you might speak to creating structural soils, but I'm not sure if creating structural soils or um, planting um, well, there's an ad supports. So, sort of along the root barrier line, there's that question about trifluor and herbicide beads along sidewalks to prevent root growth. But those uh, have been shown to uh, lose their efficacy after about five to seven years of no well, soil and, exposure. And I guess, you know, why do you want to try to redirect roots like that? I mean, if there's not enough room for a tree in that circumstance, why are we planting a tree in that circumstance? Or why are we planting a tree that gets so big that it needs that root redirection? I, I think some of these are planning errors and and or um, you know not selecting the right tree for that place, and and we have we have no end of that in California. I mean, all of LA is that way, especially when you talk about ficus microcarpa. Oh, right. what a nightmare that is! But, <laughs> you know, it's, again, putting the wrong tree where it doesn't belong. Absolutely. Um, so this person is an anonymous attendee that's asking. You know, why are public trees and community trees still being installed incorrectly? Ignorance, by and large. People just don't know any better. They don't, they don't know what the most recent um, thinking is or the research is. And that's partly why we're doing the webinar, is so that <coughs> the end user, the person selecting these things, knows what to do. And how to ask their contractor to behave. But um, some of this stems from the nursery and uh, the larger the tree you buy, the more insistent they will be as Tracy could assert uh, about how they think their, their product should be installed and it may not be the right way to install it. And then landscape architects, they, they're the ones that draw all those bad cartoons and they just don't know. And if we go back and we look at how landscape architects are trained, they're not trained horticulturally. And, and they're not trained to understand the, um, the outcome of what they recommend. Okay, so they, they come up with all these things, but they aren't necessarily studying what happens when you do those things. And so there's a lot of that kind of information out there. And it's, it's unfortunately a big, ocean of misinformation to try and overcome. But part of the reason for this webinar series is to make a small attempt at that. And then, you know, these are being recorded so that we can hopefully make them available to more and more people uh, to get them on the right track. Yeah, awesome. Brenda um, in Orange County is saying that Dave Wilson Nursery is telling them to paint the trunks of new trees, particularly avocados, yes. Again, it's taking a tree from a nursery and putting it in a fully exposed place. And so until the tree is got temporary lateral branches or enough of a canopy to shade its main stem, particularly in something like avocado, which is green stemmed, it can sunburn and some protection is needed. And so, yes, uh, farmers and growers tend to do that. They get the white latex paint out and spray the trunks. The other time you see that is when they top work or change the variety from one variety to another. They'll stump the tree, they'll graft new scions on the top 
everything gets white paint because the canopy is not there to shade the trunk. So when you have a reason for doing that, that's fine. There's no, no problem. I would add to that that um, many of Dave Wilson's videos that show uh, Mr. Sp I, I think is Spellman is uh, showing older practices that are under review, including um, heading branches and pruning to the inverted vase shape, which is traditional in production agriculture. And many of the products that Dave Wilson is supplying is for the uh, production agriculture industry. And we in our residential environments get the benefit of, of that production. So not all of his efforts are showing currently accepted and approved or agreed upon techniques for growing fruit trees. And you know, that actually is even changing for the, the farmer. I was talking to my colleague Ben about this and uh, he agrees, you know, those vase systems are terrible for production. That, you know, a tree gets to maturity and those branches are gonna break if they don't control the fruit load. It's not the structurally the best way to make a fruit tree. And so we'll talk about that a little bit with pruning. And the other thing I really resent is these nurseries telling you to prune your tree when you plant them. And I, I didn't say that in this webinar, but don't do it. You know, you shouldn't be pruning your trees when you plant them. You should be perhaps structurally pruning, and we'll talk about that next time, or correcting nursery issues that are apparent. But uh, just the idea of topping the tree when you plant it, that's so old school and wrong. We absolutely don't recommend that at any time on any tree that I can think of. And uh, my new paradigm for fruit trees, because I've been doing a lot of this lately and doing my own backyard penny ante hokey research on it, is uh, no pruning for the first two years of a fruit tree's life, none at all. No matter how bad it looks, uh, you know, whatever tree, I, and I buy trees mail order, so I'm not picking them from the nursery. So they send me my trees, I put them in the ground, I don't do anything to them. I let them grow for two years. Once they've established and I have a root system that I can count on, then I start pruning it because I need every single bud on that tree to produce oxen to stimulate every single root I can get in the first two years. So I got a tree that's growing. And uh, particularly with cherries, those are the worst, those little cherry seedlings, they, those things just wanna die. You know, you don't wanna prune those. Pruning is stunting, dwarfing, always. Hey, my persimmons uh, installed, presented it. And persimmons can be fussy in the beginning. They're slow. Yep. Okay. Um, so I think you've spoken about this in the past, but risk of spreading borers or pathogens in chipped wood mulch. Yeah, I've got a lot to say about that actually. And, and I think we'll talk more about it later, but um, there is concern because we do have new exotic, horrible pests that are out there causing havoc. Havoc. Lots of havoc. And we don't want to move those things from one area to another. The, the worst thing is to move firewood because we're moving intact chunks of tree that might have something in it. Um, once we th send that stuff through a chipper, the likelihood of whatever is in there surviving very long is very limited. Even if you just take your wood chips and stockpile them for a week, that is going to kill off 95% of everything that's in there that's bad. And the other thing is, um, this is very general now, but pests are opportunists. And they're looking for that circumstance in the environment where they have the right thing to attack and the right condition, the right susceptibility, all the right things. And they take advantage of that opportune time to cause an issue. If we chop up whatever they were in into little itty bitty pieces and put it in a pile for seven days, that is not opportunistic for them and they will decline. So if you're really concerned about that, uh, either bringing something in or sending something out, just hold it in a pile for a week and the chances of it being a problem are gonna go way, 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 way down. And I don't say that cavalierly. We've actually published peer reviewed work on it and uh, we have, you know, citations. If you're interested, you can email me. And I did this last time, and I'll do it now for those of us who are still here. 
and put my email in the chat. 154 of us are still here. But there were 200 and something of us at one time. They had to go back to work. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Do you have so any anyway. suggestions for planting trees on top of a parking lot where root space is limited to roughly four feet deep? Gosh, I have no experience with that. You don't? Is that sarcasm, Tracy? Yes, deep sarcasm. Deep, four feet deep to be exact. Um, you know, I've seen situations like that. In fact, the worst nematode situation I ever saw in my life was in one of those planter bed things on top of a garage. And they had, a, they had brought in the soil. The soil is very contained. And then they probably brought in the nematodes and it went crazy and those trees were terrible. Um, so I think a lot of that circumstance depends on the media because it's not soil at this point, is it? It's media. It's something you brought in to put in that vault to do the job. And, and that's going to determine the success, however you do that. And then the drainage, how that, that thing drains is really critical. Can't really talk to it without seeing it. I have a once healthy but unknown tree, according to this. Um, he's just not stating what kind of tree it is. The bark is beginning to crack. Is, there, is that a sign that it needs more water? The bark is cracking. I don't know what kind of tree it is, Mikhail. Can you type in what kind of tree you are referring to? And is it in turf? Or is it in, um, is it irrigated, perhaps? Maybe yeah, he left the room. Um, so we'll look at, uh, let's see, fresh was repeatedly used when referring to mulch. Does it need to be changed or just amended as needed? I'm not sure well, what that means, okay. but. When we get into mulch in a, a webinar and a half from now, uh, oh, we'll talk else? about we'll talk about that a lot. But it it needs to be fresh because fresh provides the carbon for the soil food web, and and again that's a longer discussion than we have now. And it doesn't need to be changed; it needs to be added to. So you think of mulch as something that's constantly accumulating, like litter fall. Trees don't change the litter under them unless the wind blows it away. They just add to it constantly. So with mulch, it's the same thing. We just add fresh, keep adding fresh. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, no? Uh, yeah, no, I'm reading this next question. And, <laughs> okay. and she's referring again back to Tom Spellman from um, Dave Wilson Nursery. He is saying uh, trees several trees that mature at different times to produce fruit over a longer period than one tree. That's based on chill units and when that particular cultivar ripens, that's not based on age. We purchase bare root fruit trees because they can produce fruit having been taken from a mature tree and grafted onto appropriate rootstock that we then plant into the field so that those trees not having been grown from seed are mature and ready to produce fruit immediately if we allow them to upon planting. The ripening aspect is going to be based on the cultivar, the difference in cultivar chill units and how that particular um, cultivar is um, genetically programmed for its fruit to ripen. I'm seeing some of the other questions. Are bubblers okay for fruit trees? So you might well, want to speak to that, but I, I kind of went off and on a tangent, stealing okay. your thunder. So um, go on with that. So yeah, you know, sure, but for how long? And you know, as trees grow, they need more bubbling. And so uh, I personally like flood irrigation. You know, if you can contain the water, it soaks the root ball really well. And so bubblers are fine. At, and two feet from the trunk, that's not an issue. I don't care where they are really, as long as you let it dry out in between irrigations a little bit so it's not always wet. So um, some of this really depends on, you know, age of trees, soil types, there's a lot of moving bits. Um, can you comment on espaliers? Yeah, very interesting. I think I showed in the last webinar the espalier ginkgo at the National Arboretum. I consider that high art if you can attain that. I think it's a tricky thing. Um, a lot of people have tried to do it with apples and, and you end up with a lot of sunburned apples because the espalier doesn't have enough shade for the, the top branches. 
And, or along uh, the block wall. <clears throat> yeah. With that heat index. Yeah. yeah, you get a lot of reflected heat. So I think it's it's a challenge. It's it's artistic. It serves a function to get a tree in a very narrow space or to cover a wall. And it, it could be beautiful. So I, I I'm not I don't know what other comments you want to have, but I mean, I think you have to look at your location and protect the tree as it's establishing. And if it's constantly pruned to expose thin bark, then you're going to have these sunburn issues, right? The, the person yeah. is going to have to continue to protect that. Exactly. And then, and, and, and so you, is going to yeah, have you, to be increased. Yeah, you may have to paint those stems. You may have to shade them with some shade cloth or whatever it's going to take to, to get the thing growing. But once you get sunburn and the bark is killed, then things get in there, fungi, pathogens, and it makes the whole thing a lot more difficult. I don't know how many more you want to ask, answer, but um, I can't answer this one because it's asking a question that requires tact. And as oh. you all know, I don't have tact. Why, why, why don't you just read it and I'll attempt to do it in a tactful all way, right. Tracy. How can we tactfully tell our city public works to use proper tree care at the planting, which they are not doing now? I guess to reference some of the ISA, which is International Society of Arboriculture, um, best management practices, uh, refer to the ANSI standards, which are somewhat bland, I think, but at least they're generally, you know, correct methods. Um, and or point out how whatever practices you're seeing don't follow those standards or BMPs. And, and beyond that, I don't know what you can do. It is gonna require tact and maybe it requires you buying the city arborist a cup of coffee and listening to what he has to say about how he's doing things so that you understand what their point of view is. And then slipping in some suggestions of other ways of doing it. But um, you know, those are relationship questions and they're difficult. Uh, I think one of the hard things for a lot of cities is there just isn't an arborist. There isn't somebody who's trained to do this work. And, and they, they may be, you know, people who've been put in charge of the landscape, but know very little about it. And so that, that's institutional issues like that are very difficult. And uh, it's, it's a synthesis of politics, buying people a cup of coffee, uh, being a nice guy and getting them on your side and sort of psychologically manipulating them into the right kinds of behavior. So uh, that takes time and just a lot of effort. Well, going back to the, um, the bark blast question, that tree is a cherry tree in soil as opposed to a pot, I guess. A once well, healthy cherry tree bark is beginning to crack. Is that a sign the tree needs more water? Well, the reason for cracking of a bark of bark could be sunburn. It could have been sunburn. It could be pathogens. There could be a canker disease on it. Um, it could be. Those are the two most common. Usually, not enough water. You know, you would see something in the canopy like wilting or um, dieback or something like that. So it's kind of hard to say without seeing the whole tree what exactly is going on. But anyway, I my email's out there. If you want to send me a picture, I can I can do that. Okay. Um, I accidentally dismissed that one. Sorry about that. Um, this one is interesting. I have okay. a small seasonal creek behind my property. I want a small valley oak in a raffle, and I'm wondering oh. how close I can plant it to the creek. And should well, you get rooted and check the root system? That's a really interesting question. You know, valley oaks are called that because they grow in the valley. They're usually in very deep soils, and they're not usually along creeks. So it's not that they don't, can't occur there. Certainly they can, they do, but um, valley oaks like a really deep clay or loam soil. And so along a creek may or may not be the best place for it. Will they grow? Sure, they can still grow. Um, but in terms of the ecology where you find them, that's why they call them valley oaks. They're in the bottom of the valley. 
the coast live oak or the some of the other kinds of oak, the blue oak and others like that grow in the creek drainages more and along hillsides. So if if you go to Google and just look down on your community, you can actually see where the oaks are growing. They follow river courses and drainages uh, in, in with some species. And then others like the valley oaks tend to be on the deeper loam or fertile soils. So that, that's the preference. Um, the creek in your backyard, depending on you know whatever the soil is there, maybe it could work. I don't know. This is a fascinating question coming up here. I'm sorry, did you finish that one? I'm like jumping. Yeah, we're, no, no, we're good, Tracy. I, um, the reason I talk is so you can have more time to read the questions. So this is this is fascinating because this also relates to young tree fruit, young fruit tree planting. In my opinion, this person is asking about uh, trees that have been stripped of their foliage by deer. Should they also mm. then strip the fruit to reduce the energy? output of these trees and and huh. support them oh well, that's an interesting idea i and they're asking also specifically um prior to the intense summer heat but i'm i think that that was an interesting question yeah it is because when you lose the canopy when you lose the leaves you're losing the cooling factor you're also losing the shade you're going to get more sunburn um i think the tree will come into balance. The fruit just won't mature if there's not enough resource. Uh, the first debt of a tree is to its new growth, not necessarily to its fruit. And so it will start to regenerate leaves and buds and try to do that. And things will come into equilibrium, but maybe the risk is that you'll get sunburn. And so you might wanna whitewash or or put burlap or do something to shade the parts that are getting too much sun. That would be my worry for those trees. Uh, okay, so I planted a coastal redwood in the Sierra foothills at 3000 feet elevation and it gets hot. Yeah, pruning? No. No. <laughs> How much water per week in the summer? Lots. Lots, yeah. Coastal and depends, trees. depends on your soil type too. Um, if you're in that rocky, gravy, wait a minute, rocky, gravelly soil, you're going to need to irrigate frequently. If you're in a loam or a clay, then less frequently, but always mulch. You know, mulch, mulch, mulch for redwoods, and don't prune them. Why don't prune them? Because you don't want sun on the main stem. The redwood is a forest tree that grows in dense plantings with all of its kin there shading itself. So think of these as a, a communal thing. They, they, they don't grow, redwoods don't grow, here's one redwood, like a Joshua tree might. And it's just out there and it's like Joshua glory, right? And it's got sun all around it and it's good. Redwoods don't do that. They grow on the coast, they grow in dense um, forests where they shade each other. And so the, the concept of a redwood tree that, that right there is an oxymoron in a way. And so we do see, particularly along the Sierras at that elevation in Kern County, beautiful redwood trees. How do they do that? They have great water. They're getting really pure water and they're irrigating with that good water and the redwoods like that and they grow really well for a while and until they get big and tired and overstressed with heat and no redwood neighbors. So that, that the best thing you can do for your redwood tree is to plant three more redwood trees and surround that thing. Don't prune it though. Don't prune it. Um, so finally we are, there may be some in the chat that I've not really been responding to much, but this was a house plant question. So I left it towards the end. Okay. Um, this is a person that has a 15 foot tall queen palm or a palm rather she doesn't okay. specify um, what is the best mulch for house plants she's using pine cones to keep keep her cats from you know using it as a litter box say that again 
So I'll read you exactly what she has written. What okay. mulch is appropriate for house plants? I'm using mature pine cones to keep my cats from digging and chewing on bark chips, rocks, clays, spheres. Second part in info on second question, I've got 15 foot palm in my living room that is thriving. In a container? I, I guess. Back so. I, I've always been a little bit mucked up with mulches and pots. It never seems to work as good as I think it should. And um, I've done some experiments with them. And so I have some limited knowledge. But uh, I, I guess, you know, container medias are not soil. And mulches don't have the same effects on a container medium that they would on a soil in situ. And so it's, I guess the best mulch in that environment is the one that does what you want it to do. Because I, I don't think they're gonna have a big impact on the soil underneath. Um, large pot, fishtail palm. She's large like, pot, yeah, fishtail. <laughs> Karyotis are pretty sensitive to, to changes. I kind of like the pine cone idea, but um, I think what's more important in that is repotting the plant every now and then. Because container media break down, and media breakdown is the death of indoor plants. So um, that and would be my main concern. Salinity accumulation. Yeah, and your you know your fertilization regimen, whatever that might be. So I do see a, a question. Can I share the recording to friends about to plant a tree? Are there issues with intellectual property? That seems to be the case often with UC SNR videos. I don't know what that is. SNR. They probably meant ANR. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the point of this is for it to be shared. So you can take it and spread it far and wide. Far and wide. Treat it like mulch. Six inches thick everywhere. All right. Keep, keep it fresh. So I don't know if Alexa is going to come back on. We're down to about 101 participants, and we have exhausted the question and answer bank until just now. <laughs> okay. Um, and I just added the link to the first recording in the chat oh, good. box. And I will also include on our YouTube channel the link to this recording when it's available. Yeah, we have to finish recording it. So. <laughs> the way. Um, I'm not sure what Martha is saying. She's saying, I find that there's mold if the soil stays too wet. So the question, mold is good. Mold is good. So the question is, which mulch won't keep the soil too wet? Okay, well, that's, that's not it's, soil, it's medium in a pot. So just splitting hairs, but it is. Yeah. Oh, if it's a pot, yeah. Um, so the fishtail palm is in medium and medium that contains more lava rock or perlite is going to have better drainage and hold water less than material that is highly organic in nature like peat or coir um, or also vermiculite, which is a clay material is going to hold water in high amounts. So for more aeration and better drainage, you're looking at increasing perlite or something volcanic rock particles in your medium as a component of that medium. But you control the water. Yeah, you do. That, that's what gets the plant wet, so. Yeah. Man, they're just like billions of questions just keep coming in. Okay, we're good, thank it's you. It's funny, I, I don't Martha. see them like you um, do. You don't? No, it's not the same feed for me as what you see. I'm oh, glad I'm, you're I'm getting this. Um, I see the Redwood question. I see Alexa's YouTube channel. Yeah, so I think we're, we're pretty. Oh, that's in the chat. That's why. Yeah, that's in the chat. Okay. Um, bubblers, are bubblers okay for fruit trees? They're about two feet from the trunk. Yeah, we kind of went over that a bit, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's a proximity thing. Is the soil where the roots are getting moist appropriately? Okay, so I think we're we're pretty there. Oh, uh, hold on. I see one from JAB long time ago. I we're, had a lance we're, we're funny. 
landscape designer plant my tree with burlap and a cord around it. See, that was the first mistake. Don't yeah. let a designer do the horticulture. Um, sorry, designers. I, I don't mean to say you're all bad horticulturists because you're not, but unfortunately, a lot of your brethren are bad horticulturists and they can't be trusted. So um, I was told that it would void the contract. Oh, oh I, I responded, love this. I responded to this in the Q and A, but go yeah. ahead. Because it's uh, fun. As things break down in time and keeps the roots together. Why would you want to keep the roots together? Right. Is it a party down there? What the <laughs> heck? <laughs> Is Ruth it a guardian. Gary Larson cartoon? <laughs> that I want to remain scrub like. What does that mean? What's a I think that means that they are trying to intentionally stunt the plant. I guess. I I I can see no reason why you'd want to do that. And there's this habit back east of planting the burlap. Why would you do this? No, you take that off, root wash that baby and put it in the ground, fill it with native fill. You okay, want that well, except, to get going. Except huh? in the cases where the tree is dug from a field grown condition and is moved to a site that has a similar soil texture, that ball is gonna be wrapped with the burlap to transport it. In right. that case, I don't know that I would recommend root washing because it's being transported immediately to the new site. And that is often done in places like Michigan, Wisconsin, areas such as that. Yep. We're talking about California conditions where we ball and burlap trees and set them there and let them stay like that for some time. That's bad, right? Right. And that's when you do not want to retain the burlap. I mean, you don't want to retain it ever, but you might not want to wash the roots in some cases, where in other cases, it would be much more encouraged. Of course, I think Linda would say wash, wash them all, but she's got a predilection to that. So here's another one that you probably answered as well, but it's, it's interesting to me. And, and this is, uh, in many new developments, soils heavily compacted. You noted that if the soil is heavily compacted, you may plant differently. What tests do you use to assess compaction? And how do you adjust planting techniques? That's really a very enlightened question, I think, Susan. It, I don't know if you're still here, Susan, but um, the, the way you adjust or the way you assess compaction is with a bulk density test. And it has to be done usually by a testing lab that has a correct sampler that can take intact cores and figure out what your bulk density is. And, and then you would wanna do that quite a, you know, quite a few samples to get an average. And so it's expensive and time consuming, but a good bulk density test is if nothing grows on your soil, it's probably pretty compact. And so how do you uncompact it? Well, you can put wood chips down and wait for a few years, or you can get in there and bust it up. And you'll destroy the structure temporarily, but you can then plant in it. So those are kind of the rough crude answers to that. Okay, so I'm scanning through all the questions you answered probably. Julia yeah. Gowan, what are you doing here? Hi, Julia. Hi, Julia. <laughs> uh, what did she say? Is the industry standard for planting very thin but disproportionately tall trees still to leave the nursery stake on, but cutting it? No, it is not. It's just wrong. Don't do it. it the, the correct standard is never leave the nursery stake in ever, period. Always remove. Always, always. Hi, Susan Trong, student. Would you use this type of support for shrubs? <laughs> They're being converted into trees in the future. No, shrubs don't need support. Shrubs are their own support. They That's can support themselves. That is growing to be a tree for the future. It's yeah. Well, it anyway, how on whether it can stand alone unstaked. I'm skipping to the bottom. Do we have anything new? No. No, just comments. Okay, guys. Um, it was fun. Let's do it again next week. Next week, it'll get even better. <laughs> is I'm gonna ask you questions this time. I get my revenge. You have to answer the questions. And so we'll see what that, how that goes.
So one of our um, lacking encourage anonymous attendees is challenging you. You can um, oh, test well okay. compaction um, by penetration. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually responded to. Yes, well, you can. Use a screwdriver, you, push it in the soil. You can, but how do you know what that means, actually, unless you calibrate it? And how, how <laughs> exactly. do you calibrate a screwdriver? And you can go, yeah, it's compacted. Not calibrated. But what, but what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. you know, unless you have numbers, you don't know. And so, so that's all the those. Difference between science and practical application. Right. Okay. And also, a dry soil always appears compacted. Try and stick your screwdriver in a dry soil. Doesn't mean it's compacted, just means it's dry. So, at what moisture content is it compacted or not compacted? It's it's actually a very complicated thing, and um, I I kind of like the letting the plant tell you. If mm -hmm. if the plants are not happy, then and the soil appears compacted, then yeah, it's. Probably yeah. compacted if it walks like a duck. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. If it's a tomato, it's, very, it's a vegetable. It's very duck like. So um, I cannot pronounce your name. I apologize. Iha. I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing that. You asking about your parking lot question. And yeah, we address that with a little bit of a cavalier attitude because I encountered a declining Quercus agrifolia that had actually been. Um, covered with three separate parking lot depths and was excavated to approximately eight feet to find the lowest portion of the uh, oldest parking lot surface. When that property changed to drip irrigation and reclaimed water on that mature um, 102 inch diameter Quercus agrifolia approximately, um, that, those conditions change the environment of the root system for that tree substantially enough to cause it to enter a, a decline spiral. So when you're talking about growing plants with a, um, what would you call it? It's not like an agriculture where it's a compacted zone. It's not a layered compacted zone, but a parking lot in effect is a compaction zone or an impervious layer to the plant at a depth where your main concern is going to be um, infiltration, capillary action of toxins that are brought back up from the deeper soil through flooding actions and insufficient of quality irrigation from the surface downward to provide the appropriate depth of irrigation across the plant's absorptive root system capacity. So where the roots are has to be watered even in a parking lot situation where you have a barrier to deep drainage. And you still have to manage those roots and the oxygen, et cetera, in the root zone area that is absorbing um, nutrients and water from that upper 24 inches of the soil profile. So it's a management situation for a tree or any plant when you have an impervious uh, barrier below it. So I just wanted to give that person the attention because they responded again with that question. Is there anything that you would like to correct or add? No. Okay. I think, yeah, that, that tree that you were thinking about though, that had quite a history of layers of um, impervious zones that prevented movement of water. And, uh, and I guess the thing that strikes me about that is that all these sites have a history, you know, what, and unless you were there the whole time and know the history, you may not know what's under the ground and, and what's impeding movement of water or causing water to come up. Um, so understanding the, the history of the site, that's really critical to knowing the horticulture of the site. And that, that's something that takes either talking to people or digging holes and pits and seeing what's down there and discovering what's happening. So that, that that's quite a process, I think. Okay, what else do we have? Anything else? I think Are that's, we good? that's pretty much it, yeah. We've, we've, we've gone exhausted off. every question? I think we've exhausted everyone. We're down to 69 participants, so. Well, that's a good number that's to awesome. put on.
<laughs> it's an okay. awesome number to quit on, but I'm I'm really pleased that so many people are willing to stay and listen to our. Oh, it's it's the banter. You got to have the banter. <laughs> That's the best part. Well, next time the audience gets to banter early on in the pruning thing, because we're going to survey you on your attitudes about pruning trees and see what you think and then tell you why you're right or wrong. So that should be fun next week and uh, look forward to seeing you all back then.